Okay, case seven. This is a 40-year-old female with a three-centimeter mass arising from the posterior cervical spinal nerve root. And you can already see, wow, look at all that pigment. Really, really dark, abundant pigment, even from low power. If we look over at the edge here, there's kind of a fibrous, fibrous, dense fibrous tissue around much of the lesion. But over here, if we go in closer, we'll go look at the lesion in a second. It helps you orient where we are. We're actually not only in the nerve root, but actually out in the ganglion. And you can see the background that has that neural appearance and scattered around in here are large ganglion cells. So this tumor is arising from the nerve root, kind of pushing out next to the ganglion. And now let's go look at the tumor itself. It's composed of kind of sheets to fascicles of these atypical large kind of epithelioid to spindled cells with very, uh, very prominent nucleoli. You can see these large nucleoli here. Oh, and I forgot to mention uh, Yaman had to step out to go to sign out, so that's why he's not chiming in anymore. Um, but you can see these large atypical cells and there's abundant brown pigment and this pigment is actually melanin pigment. So when you see kind of atypical, ugly looking cells that have large nuclei and have abundant cytoplasm and they're making melanin pigment, well, guess what? That looks an awful lot like uh, metastatic melanoma, doesn't it? But a three centimeter metastasis of melanoma to the cervical spinal root with no history of melanoma and no other lesions present. Is that possible? Well, I suppose so. Melanoma can do anything, but that seems awfully unlikely, right? So in that case, when you think something looks kind of like metastatic melanoma and stains like metastatic melanoma, but it's arising from a spinal nerve root, the tumor that you should think of is this one, malignant melanotic nerve sheath tumor. Now that is a tumor you may not have heard of before because it's a relatively new name. In the older days, uh, like when I was in training not that long ago, these were called melanotic schwannoma or somomatous melanotic schwannoma because they do have some overlapping features microscopically with schwannomas, but we now recognize that they really are a different tumor with a different behavior. I'm gonna point out here, because someone's gonna ask once they look at the slide, there are all sorts of vacuolations here that really look an awful lot like lipoblastic type cells. There are all these vacuolations. I don't know, I assume these must be lipid droplets because they're clear and indenting the nucleus but I'm not uh, as sure what the significance of this is. Maybe someone out there can tell me, maybe it's been described before and I just overlooked this feature in one of the papers. I've only seen a small handful of these tumors and each one has looked a little bit different, but they all keep in, in common the fact that they're producing melanin pigment and have these kind of spindle to epithelioid cells. Some of them like this one look very ugly and have huge nucleoli um, and look quite a lot like uh, melanoma, but I've seen other ones that were a little bit more bland and monotonous and uniform cellularity and uh, were a bit more spindle and not as epithelioid as these. So they can really range between spindled cells and fascicles to more epithelioid cells in these kind of diffuse syncytial sheets where it looks like all the cytoplasm from each cell is blending together to make kind of a sea of cytoplasm. So they can vary, but, but they often, the production of pigment, which is usually present, it seems, um, in the ones I've uh, encountered at least, that can really help tip you off. And the spinal nerve roots are the most common location, but they've been described in a variety of other locations, including the GI tract, skin, soft tissue, bone, I think maybe the liver, if I recall correctly. So there's been, you know, like everything, eventually people will describe them in all sorts of weird locations. I think in those other locations, you have to be really careful to make sure you've excluded metastatic melanoma. That's an important uh, rule here. And in the past, we really didn't have too much to do because if you stain these tumors, they stain like melanoma. They stain with S100 protein and SOX10, and usually with a variety of melanocytic markers, including HMB45 and MART1 or MELANA, whichever name you like. So those things, um, are that's not gonna really solve the problem for you. There, it's a tumor that's making melanin and stains like melanoma. Okay, so now we know though that these tumors have loss, usually have loss of a gene called PARKAR1, P-R-K-A-R-1, PARKAR1A actually, is inactivated. And that is the gene, if you uh, remember from, from medical school, that's the gene that's involved in carney complex, a germline 
um, in activation of uh, PARCAR 1A, uh, which is in about, I think, half or so of Carney syndrome, or Carney complex, excuse me. I don't know that it's in every case, but it's a gene that's highly associated with Carney complex. And this tumor, which has a tendency to arise in the setting of in patients with Carney complex, this tumor has loss of PARCAR 1A. So you can either prove that by showing PARCAR 1A mutations. Uh, molecularly, or you can do the immunostain, which shows loss of expression of PARCAR uh, 1A. So now that we know that and have an easy test for this, it's very helpful that if you're having a debate between um, malignant melanotic nerve sheath tumor and metastatic melanoma, that you can send and have, uh, have the test for PARCAR 1A done to see if the tumor is lost. And both Carney, patients with Carney complex can have that loss, but also the majority of, of the tested cases in sporadic that have occurred sporadically in patients without Carney also have loss of Parker 1A. And so my fellowship director in Dermpath, Doug Parker, said the way to remember that Parker 1A for Carneys is you park your car in the garage, park for Parker 1A and car for Carney. So sometimes those little mnemonics can be really helpful. That's helped me and I've remembered it all these years later. Now there's one other feature I wanted to point out to you before we talk a bit about behavior, and that is the old name of this, like I said, is somomatous melanotic schwannoma. And that's because they make melanin and they have some kind of neural schwannian looking features microscopically in some cases, not so much this one, but look right here. And I wish I could show you, it's hard to show up on the camera, but hopefully you can see this little calcification here with little rings of lamellated rings here. So that's a somoma body. Now, the, the bad news is that these somoma bodies, while they're really great when you find them, I, I can't recall ever seeing a melanoma with somoma bodies. I've seen quite a few melanomas, but I suppose it's possible. And uh, maybe if you do a literature search, you'll find someone that's described it. Although I would be really hesitant to accept that unless they've done the uh, Parker 1A uh, test on the case. But in any case, I don't think I've ever seen somoma bodies in a melanoma, but they are not always present in a uh, malignant melanotic nerve sheath tumor. Um, AKA somomatous melanotic schwannoma. About half of cases will have somoma bodies. As you can see, there's multiple right here, 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 here. So very nice example, but um, some cases lack them. About half of cases have them and half don't. I think there was another focus around here that had even more actually, but those were pretty good. So um, you can check out the digital slide once I have it scanned. I'll put the link down below and really explore this case for yourself. So the, what's the point of renaming this tumor? In the past, it was called melanotic schwannoma, and now we're, we're changing the name to malignant melanotic nerve sheath tumor. It's also been referred to, at least in one paper, as malignant melanotic schwannian tumor. Well, the reason is that these tumors do not behave like schwannomas. Schwannomas are totally benign and indolent and extremely rarely can show malignant transformation, but otherwise they're benign. But this tumor, a subset of them behave in a malignant fashion and an aggressive fashion like a sarcoma. And in some papers, the rate of metastatic, uh, metastatic risk in these tumors is around 15%, but other studies have shown it to be as high as 45 or 44%, excuse me. So it really runs a range from the different series. And particularly when you look out at patients who so you follow them up over five years or longer, in patients that are, that are more than five years out from their original diagnosis, um, only about half of patients are disease free. So it seems that this is a tumor that despite initial thoughts that it could behave indolently most of the time, um, it, a significant subset of patients, maybe even up to half of patients over the long term, can have aggressive behavior and metastases and have a behavior that's similar to a sarcoma. So that's why now it's important. And I think when I've, when I've made this diagnosis in practice, I've mentioned in my report in the comment that this has been called um, somomatous melanotic schwannoma in the past, but it's important to recognize that these tumors actually do not behave like schwannomas and they do have a potential for malignant behavior and need to be treated and managed accordingly. So I think that's the important thing to take home here is to remember that they, they are not like regular schwannoma and it's important to uh, distinguish them from metastatic melanoma either clinically or by testing for parkr one a and then uh, also to uh, check if the patient has other features that might suggest that they actually have undiagnosed carney complex. And so that is an example of a very rare tumor, and this is a really, really characteristic example of, of that tumor. So hopefully you will have learned from this and enjoy the chance to see something very rare. And oh yeah, there we go. See, there is a little bit of palisading there. It's vague, it's not like perfect, 
very K bodies or anything, but you can appreciate that they're, the cells are kind of lining up in rows here. The nuclei are kind of lining up side by side in little parallel arrays. And then there's little zones in between of pink that don't have as much. So that's where the idea that these maybe were some sort of a schwannoma came from originally, that they do have areas sometimes that look kind of schwannoma-like. But over time, um, and even with molecular studies, uh, I believe the Andrew Fulps group did a study where they looked at melanomas and schwannomas and then these tumors, and they found that if you do a uh, gene profiling study, these cluster in a different area from away from melanoma and away from schwannoma. So they're not totally like schwannomas and they're not totally like melanomas. They're kind of their own thing, um, which seems to make sense since they have a unique behavior that's different from both of those tumors.